I'm going to ask, I don't know, I'm going to ask a question that, I get, you might call this a little kid question, right? Because little kids ask great questions. You know, why is the sky blue? Um, why is the ocean always so close to the shore? Um, those kinds of things, right? And sometimes it's good to look at them because sometimes... You may look and say, well, that's obvious or whatever, but it, it can, I think it can provoke some good thoughts. So we're going to start today with one of those kinds of questions. Not that I think a kid, little kid would ask this question. I don't know. That would be a little, little smart aleck of a kid, I think, to ask this kind of question. But they, those do exist in the world, all right, so it's possible. My question is, what makes for... a good program. Oh. And we can extend that to be application system. Um, a program being kind of like one unit that we've been working on. As an application being maybe a collection of related units. A system being maybe a collection of related applications internally. What makes for a good one? We're software developers. Our job is to learn how to develop software. So we ought to know when we did a good job, right? We ought to know what the goal is. So what makes for a good program? Yes? The users don't complain much. The users don't complain much. That's true. They don't complain much. Maybe. All right. That might be true sometimes. Let's put it this way. If the opposite is true, there's a good chance it isn't a good program. All right. If you're getting complaint after complaint or complaint. But I can think of one or a couple situations where just because the users don't complain doesn't mean it's good. Can you think of a situation where the program could be horrible? But you don't get any user complaints. Yes? Oh, I, I mean, I'm sure they get user complaints, but like most government entities have terrible websites. Okay. And you just kind of got to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, that's a possibility where there's really no other alternative in town. There will be another case where a site, an a, 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 a application would be horrible, but you don't get any complaints about it. And cell phones, all the games, if they have like, glitches and stuff, people don't really report them or. Yeah. Or all right, so mobile application. You have a problem with a mobile application, what do you do with it? Do you write a lengthy letter to the developer saying what is wrong with it? No, what do you do? Delete it. Delete it. Just delete it, that's what I All mean. right, so you may not have complaints, all right, but doesn't mean it's good. Another example would be a website. I would say it would be a similar thing. You are looking for shoes, all right, for some occasion. So you go to Shoes R Us, all right, and it's a horrible website. And you can't find your size, you can't find what you're looking for, um, you get errors, all kinds of things pop up. Are you likely to write an email to them? Probably not. What, you'll, what will you do? You go to a competitor. We are Shoes, all right, and you'll shop there. And if it works, well, they'll get, to, they'll get your order, all right. So user complaints, yeah, that feedback that you get from people would be a good, would be partly an indicator of whether it's good or not, but not completely. Other thoughts? What makes a good program, let's say? An another, in other words, what you guys are saying is, uh, it's, it's, fr it's, it's my Friday, so I'm, I'm a little, uh, little wound up, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the weekend. In other words, if we don't know what makes for a good program, in other words, I just sign grades randomly then, right? I just like, yeah, you know, this person, yeah, they, they showed up for class, so I'll give them a tab or whatever. Yes? I was going to say, like, ease of use. Right? Ease of use. It's different for each person. Okay. It is different for each person, but... We could probably make some general statements. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Do you put people?
people through hoops to do something? Does something that seems fairly simple take one step or takes 15 steps? All right. So usability, I would say, is a factor. Um, usability, yeah. Again, there's a degree of subjectivity to that. But there's also cases where we can look at two things side by side and say, yeah, this one's a lot more usable than this one is. So, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you know, it's, it's like, like many things, you know. There is some subjectivity, but there also is some things that I think we can all agree on. So usability. The more usable site uh, pages or program is, probably the better it is. Yes? Customizable. Customizable. It's a good one. All right, if I have two news applications, all right? Bless you. You're welcome. One of which shows me the news stories it picks, one of, it, one of which allows me to pick the areas I'm interested in and show those news stories. And I'll probably give the edge to the customizable one. All right? Something else. Accessibility. Accessibility. Very good. Especially when you're talking about web stuff, but other things as well. Accessibility. What do we mean by accessibility? And how is that different than usability? They're very related, and there, I'm sure there's some crossover. But what's the difference between when we, when we say usability versus accessibility? Yes? Um, differently able people mm -hmm. will be able to use it no matter like, what their issue Exactly. And again, uh, the notion of accessibility is that um, people, regardless of abilities, works for the differently abled. So if I have two applications, one of them is accessible, one of them isn't. You have uh, two news applications. One of which has a video on it that contains video and an audio track. The other contains a video that has video and an audio track and a text transcript. Which one's better? One with a text transcript, right? Because everyone can uh, access that one. All right. Uh, as opposed to the one with just the video, if you can't hear, you can't make out what the what the audio is. Other things. Trying to think of my own head. I should, write, I should write these down so I don't forget them as I'm thinking in my head. All right, that's always good. Yes, yeah, thinking in your head is always good as opposed to like thinking with your feet or with your elbow or something like that. Okay. Wow, we missed one that I think we would have gotten. Looks good. All right. Um, I'm going to say well designed. And part of that goes with usability. One thing that I talk about a lot in my web development classes is that when we talk about web design, we're not just we're not just interested in making it look good. We use colors, we use different fonts, we use those things to more effectively communicate what it is that we want to communicate. So, we had color our page. It has the effect of making it look better, you know, but it also has the effect of letting the user visually organize our page. Uh, I had a great example yesterday in my web development class where all I did was put color on the headings. All right? And if you compared the earlier version with no color on the headings with the other one, it was so clear how the page was divided in sections then. It's just obvious. It jumped out at you. You didn't even have to like read the page. You could just glance at it and see how it was divided. Um, so well design has to do with that as much as it has to do with looking nice. All right? But looking nice is a consideration. Right? Certainly no organization wants an ugly website, despite what you may see out there on certain organizations' websites. All right? Um, there's a real, real obvious one that we missed. And I'm thinking we 
missed it because you're assuming it. Yes? Security. Well, security, that'd be a good one. Yes, security. I'm just trying to decide if I can lump a second thing in with that or not. I'm not going to. Yes? As a, a good program has a purpose. Okay, I think we're getting into, I think we're getting into uh, the, the area that I think was, well, that, that we missed, the obvious one. And that is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to phrase it a little bit differently. We'll come back to what you said about having a purpose. But the program, what makes for a good program, all these things are great, but you're missing a key thing. It runs. It works. Not just runs, but works. Yeah, it works too. Right. Which would include it running, because if it didn't run, it couldn't work. All right. And it would include having a purpose. Why? How can we say a program works if we don't know what we're supposed to do? Right? So I have a program, you put in a number, you press a button, and you get a result. Did it work? I don't know. What was it supposed to do? Was it supposed to take the square root of the number? Was it supposed to convert from Fahrenheit to centigrade? Was it supposed to? So it works. And by work, it means that it successfully implements its purpose. I guess is one way to say it, to include the word purpose. Another way to say it is that it, the results match the specifications. And this is a real important concept, right? That that's when a program works, if it matches the specifications. Now, There's another step in there, too. I was going to leave it at that, but I'm on a roll, so don't hold me back. All right? Specifications match user goals is step two of that. I could have a, a program that correctly calculates the square root of a number, right? It does it perfect to 15 decimal points, all right? However, what the users wanted was a program to calculate the cube root of a number, or convert Fahrenheit to centigrade, or whatever, pounds to yen, all right? Then it's not a good program. It doesn't work, all right? So, Key to this, sort of the, the pivot, the pivot man in this uh, example, is the specifications. Specifications have to be accurate, first of all. They have to match to as great a degree as possible what the user's goals are. Well, and and, and the, the user uh, being both the, the end user who's using the application and the organization that's creating the, the, the thing. Again, I'm sort of thinking in terms of websites because this is a web development class. Um, but this applies to other kinds of software as well, all right? Um, end results match the specifications. Key to that happening is there has to be specifications, <laughs> right? You, you can't match specifications if there aren't any. And how do you know that your program matches the specifications? Well, that's how you, that's how you, that's how you get your result, that's how you get your specifications matching the user goals. You talk to the end user and you talk to all the people, sometimes they're called stakeholders, all right? And other people that, people that one way or another are going to use the, the program or the results of the program. So you talk to all the stakeholders, all right? Um, so you do that, let's say, and let's assume you did a good job on that, which is quite an assumption because that's actually pretty hard, all right? If you talk to one kind of user as opposed to another, you might get sort of an unbalanced perspective of what the application is supposed to do. Uh, years ago, I worked for a car rental agency. 
And it was interesting, some of the, this was back in the early days of my career, and it was interesting, a lot depended on like which users you talk to. For example, management has different expectations out of a system than the people in the trenches that are doing the day-by-day -day job. The managers just want their reports so that they can carry them around and scowl and look important, all right? Uh, the day-to-day -day users, they have to handle angry customers on the phone, right? So if you produce an application that creates the nice reports formatted exactly the way the managers want, that gives them the information they need, that's great. But if it doesn't handle the day-to-day -day, people in the trenches, users, people taking phone calls from customers, let's say, but doesn't handle their needs, then the application isn't good. It needs to handle across a range of, of users. Let's assume, though, we have the specifications defined correctly. All right? And in this class, what are the specifications? Well, the lab assignments. Now, what happens if you don't understand the specifications? You ask for clarification. Right? I ask. I do the best job I can trying to write up things that are not confusing. The interesting thing about teaching is you can spend so much time writing up things that you think are very perfectly clear, and people will have all sorts of questions about it. Stuff that you just didn't think of. Stuff that you assume that people would assume and they didn't assume it, or whatever. So that's fine to ask questions if you don't understand what the specifications are. All right? Software development doesn't necessarily flow in a, uh, sometimes they call it the waterfall approach, where the first step happens and the second step and the third step. Sometimes like when you're doing something, you go have to go and revisit the specifications and decide, well, what did they really want? All right. How do you make sure the results don't match the specifications? Let's assume that we have specifications that are well defined. You test each specification. You test it. Right. Test it. And I like how you said, you said about test, testing each specification. What I see students do too often is that they have a program that they're ready to turn in, all right? Um, they run it, let's say it was Fahrenheit to centigrade. They run it and they get one result and it looks right. Maybe they run it a second time and it looks all right. Um, and they think that it's correct. It's important to test thoroughly. And testing thoroughly involves running several test cases um, and involves um, comparing what you get with the actual results. And uh, to a greater degree possible, it tests for every possible condition that could occur. All right? What's every possible condition that could occur in our Fahrenheit to centigrade <coughs> conversion? Let's try to define that. Remember what we had. Remember our final, our final result. We had a text box, a drop down with select F to C, C to F. Then we have a label to produce to show the results. What's every possible combination? to test? Nothing in the text box. Nothing in the text box is one. Yes. Letters in the text box. Letters in the text box. Negative numbers. Negative numbers in the text box. Good. Symbols in the text box. Symbols in the text box. Um, beyond the range? Beyond the, beyond the range if we define a range. If we define that this should work from negative 100 to 100 or whatever, it's beyond the range. All right? Another example. I would say all those examples, let's switch from the drop down box, so you gotta do like all of them for Yeah, it sells just the Fahrenheit and then do all of the same right. tests for Fahrenheit and Celsius. Right. Uh, to really thoroughly test this, you do all of them for each of these combinations of things. You test if that was empty. You'd finally test your um, one of the one of the um, one place I worked with called it the happy user condition. 
it was when the program actually worked and gave you, gave you results. In other words, not any of the error possibilities. But you'd finally test if you did a conversion, uh, if, that it really gave you the number that you want. Would you just test one value? Why not? Could have been a fluke. You could write a function that coincidentally, for one thing, gives you the right results. For example, you could write a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion that said Fahrenheit equals centigrade plus 32. That's not correct, right? So if I put in 0 centigrade and I add 32 to it, I get 32 Fahrenheit. That's correct for 0 centigrade, but that's clearly not the right function. I'd have to test other things. So you'd test multiple things to make sure you had that. So we're just talking about a real simple thing here. And we've come up with, I don't know, I wasn't actually literally counting them, but uh, we came up with 20-ish, uh, I would say, 15 to 20-ish conditions that we ought to test for this real simple program. All right? It's important to do that. Now, I will say that in some schools of thought, if you peek at the code, um, you can eliminate some of the possibilities. For example, you're absolutely right in saying that um, I should test all those conditions with each of the three options. But if I looked at the code, I'd know that the option doesn't really come into play as far as the validation goes. The validation of the text box. So I could probably get away with not testing some of them. This is why there's bugs in programs, right? If you imagine something so simple having so many uh, possibilities, something complicated is going to have an astronomical number, one of those things. What happens if you run such and such game and you are using this uh, uh, video card with this driver and blah, 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 blah? Well, that's why things blow up and that's why things don't work. It's very difficult uh, to, to guarantee that things will work. That is, by the way, uh, one of Apple's competitive advantages. All right? I'm not here to, to promote Apple versus Windows or whatever, but one of the things that works to Apple's advantage is they control their hardware. So you don't have a million options for video cards, so you don't have to worry about it working with a bunch of different possibilities. You have a much limited number of possibilities, therefore it's easier to thoroughly test. All right? The downside of that is you're stuck with using those parameters. You know, you're stuck with using that video card. You can't customize it as much as you can. Okay, so one thing we'll probably do in this class, uh, um, we didn't do it for this example uh, or, or any of the assignments so far, but we probably will for, for future assignments. And um, maybe I'll go over some of these things in class as well. Is is you come up with a test plan? In other words, you don't stick these in your head and say, "Well, I'm going to test these 15 things," and then hope you remember all 15 of them when it's time to go and test. What's more is you keep the test plan around because what if you go and change something? Fahrenheit to centigrade is a pretty simple example, right? And and no one's going to change the rules of Fahrenheit to centigrade. But if you had something like a shipping calculation, all right, that shipping calculation could change several times a year, possibly, depending on what the options were. You want to keep that test plan because if it worked today and you need to make a change to something, you probably should go back and test everything again. That is known as regression testing, all right? You test to make sure that your change you make didn't put you backwards. All right, that it didn't break something that already worked. All right. Um, sort of going hand in hand with this, because we talked a lot about air checking and air handling, is our program is fault tolerant. In other words, there's a problem the user's informed about it and told what they can do to fix it. So in our simple example, the faults that we are tolerating are things like someone entered in a wrong value. 
So the program doesn't blow up. It tells them nicely, hey, please enter a number here. Please make a selection for the type of conversion. In other cases, the faults could be something to have nothing to do with the user. For example, what if you go to do a database search in your application and the database had crashed a minute ago? All right, what do you do? Well, you should inform the user in terms that they understand sort of what happened. All right, they may not understand the idea of a database crashing or why a database crashes, but you could express it in some way and tell them what they need to do. Um, try the search again later. All right, something like that. Now, um, the last thing that we're going to that I'm going to put on this list is good code. Ah, yes. In this class. Well, the only user we have is, is me, so if I complain a lot about your program, then, you know, to change it. Usability, we're going to consider that, right? It's not the focus of this class, but it's something that you should strive for. Customizable, we might talk about a little bit later on, but that's not going to be stress. Accessibility, sort of the same thing about you as usability, uh, uh, usability. We're not really stressing it. Well designed, same thing. Security, a little bit. Works, we're definitely interested in. Fault tolerant, we're definitely interested in. And we're definitely interested in good code. All right? So, if I had two programs that did one through eight equally, the tiebreaker of which one gets the prize would be how good the code is. All right? What makes for good code? Besides one through eight, yes. Less is better. Less is better. You you guys are talking way too fast for me. I'm still back as less is better. <laughs> okay. Less is better, sort of. In some situations, I I'm not prepared to make a blanket statement about that. All right. Readability, someone said. I like that. If two, if you have two pieces of code and one is real easy to read and understand and the other one isn't, the nod goes to one that's real easy to understand. That's one thing in my mind that trumps the short code. Is you can write incredibly terse short code that is impossible to read. All right? Yes? Um, you might also find Okay. It has to be, it, the person who comes in after you has to be able to edit it. Okay, the person who comes behind you has to edit it. And you know what? Has to edit it and change it. You want to make their life easy. Someone else had a comment. I forget. Was it you? Uh, lack of redundancy. Lack of redundancy. All right. These three things, readability, being aware that someone else is going to go back and change it, and guess what? You may have to go back and change it um, after uh, three weeks or a month or six months and where you barely remember working on this and the code looks foreign to you as well. So you, future you, is almost the same as someone brand new coming in to maintain it, right? Because you don't have to have forgotten about everything. And finally, lack, uh, lack of redundancy. What's wrong about redundancy? Redundancy is having essentially stuff duplicated. What's wrong about redundancy is if you have to change something, you might have to change it in two places. All right? And I, I use this example in one of my other classes. I hope none of you guys are hearing this as a repeat. But you guys remember Pee Wee's Playhouse? <laughs> yeah. Remember that? All right? He had, Pee Wee had the word of the day, right? You remember that? So whenever he said a certain word, all the little kids were supposed to scream. Scream loud or their parents are probably trying to sleep in, right? All right, brilliant. The 
the equivalent of that for programmers is redundant code. If you see redundant code, you should give a little scream to yourself. All right, not out loud. All right, please, I don't want screaming happening in lab and, and, and startling me and having security called to the scene and so on. Because that's a sign that something's bad. That's a sign that something is wrong. All right? So, those three things, being able to read the code, being aware that someone that didn't originally write the code, or you who have forgotten how you wrote the code, might come and maintain it. And redundancy, if you put those together, the one word answer for this is maintainability. That is key. All right? That is key to good code. So if you have two pieces of code, and one of them, if something changes, you have to change things in three places, and one of them, if something changes, you have to change it in one place, guess what the better code is? The one that you only have to change it in one place. All right? Now, good programmers can anticipate this and can see situations, even before they develop, of where you are likely to evolve duplicate code and can take steps to, to eliminate that from happening. All right? Um, so writing programs with the eye towards maintainability is one of the top things that you can do. And one of the things that we're going to stress in this class is writing code that is maintainable. All right. Along with these other things. Fault tolerant, works, and so on. Okay, that was the longest introduction in history. Now let's look at some code. And let's look at this code. And let's play some what if games where we think about what could happen in the future. And again, if you have redundant code, the other thing that could happen is you forget to change it in one place. Or you uh, change it uh, and make a mistake changing it in the second place. So let's... Bring up the code example. Oh, wait a minute. This is something different than I thought it was. <coughs> okay, so I've messed up this computer. Oh, and look, here is here's the desk. That's what that is. I thought it was just like a reading lamp because I can't see the keyboard. Indeed it is. Okay, we're going to try this. Take two. This, by the way, proves the oldest law of tech support, which is what? Turn it off, turn it back on. All right? Yeah. 
All right, let's use, let's pull up the, the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion and let's think about some things that could happen in our little mini application. Studio. I want to review how I open it again because this could be a little different than you open stuff in C Sharp and, and uh, like in the regular uh, intro to C Sharp class. So I'll go into Visual Studio. I'll go File, Open, Website. I will go and find the thing that has um, the web config file in it and open it. And now I'm good to go. One thing a number of students ran into uh, in doing, um, I think, lab two is by default, your web config file creates like this. If you do, if it, if you use a default web config file and try to run this, if you have any validation controls on your page, it's going to blow up. It's going to give you this error. Blah 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 blah. That makes me angry because the way that they implemented this between versions of ASP.NET, but nothing you can do about it other than deal with it. The way that you deal with it is you go into the web config file and put these lines of code. App settings. Yes. So go into my example and copy that app settings, add key equals validation settings, blah, 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 blah. blah. I don't know why it didn't do that by default. It should have done that by default, in my humble opinion. But it doesn't. All right? And therefore, you got to do it for it. Yes. Okay. So now when we run it, we don't get that error. Enter temperature. Fahrenheit to centigrade. Centigrade to Fahrenheit. And then convert. to not have it where you have to click the submit button? I think we did. I must not have saved that right version. All right. Or maybe maybe it's for saved the, under. For the animals. For the what? The zoo one. Ah, the zoo there one. we go. Thank you. Yes, the Thank zoo you. one. All right. So you can see an example how to do that code. That's right. I forgot we did the zoo uh, last time. All right. Uh, let me run this again. Right now, we have code that works if you enter a value in this text box and click this button. It'll work. All right? What if we put something else on this page that did the conversion? Just what if we had some other place on this page where we needed to do the conversion? All right? What would we have to do the way it's written now? Well, that code, right now, 
lives in the button click event. Okay. That's the only place where that code can run. All right. So if I put something else on the screen, if I put a drop down where you pick certain things like you could pick the boiling point of water and it would show it to you in centigrade and, and Fahrenheit and the freezing point of water and uh, the highest, the today's temperature and all those different things. If I had a drop down that did all that and I wanted to call this function. It'd be difficult, right? Because if I had a drop down, there might be, for example, another button associated with it. All right? Therefore, it would be difficult for me to use this code because this code right now lives in the button click event. All right? Which means I could not easily use any other event to trigger this code. What's more, this code puts the results in a specific label, which means that I couldn't put the code, or the results rather, in any other label. That's not a good thing. What's more, if I were to add another page that also needed this conversion, I'd have to duplicate the conversion. Now again, Fahrenheit to centigrade is not that big of a calculation. But it does become a big deal if you have duplicate versions of it because you maybe made a mistake on one of them. You didn't copy and paste it right. Or if it was a more complicated calculation like shipping cost or something along those lines, then maybe we would need to go back and change it at some later point in time. The point is is any of those things would be redundant code. Redundant code means that if it's wrong, you could, have, uh, you could have inconsistent results. If you need to change it, you could change it in one place and not in the other. You could have one page saying one thing, another page saying a different thing, because it has duplicated code. So our goal will be to get rid of duplicated code. Now you could go and add, you could go and prove this to yourself by going and adding that calculation on different pages. All right? But we're just going to pretend, and that's what we're going to find. That if I added another thing on this page, if I created another page, I would have to have this code duplicated. So that's not a good thing. No. All right? What is the fix of that? How can we make this code so that it only lives in one place? Yes. How can we make it so? Yes. A function? Put it in a function. Yeah, there you go. Put it in a function. Okay. So we're going to put it in a function. We're going to do this incrementally. Now, when you do this, you don't need to do it incrementally. All right, we're just going to jump to the final answer. But one thing I could do to make this page um, able to, um, able to uh, call the same code in different places would be to create a function for this. All right? I'm going to go, just for laughs, and I'm going to get rid of the validation. Just for now. Okay. You can go to Wednesday or uh, Tuesday's example if you want to see the validation. But I'm going to eliminate the validation just for now. I'm actually going to show you what I mean about duplicated code. I decided I'm going to sh I want to show you duplicated code. So I'm going to put in a drop down that says. I'm just going to put a couple of things on here. Freezing point of water.
which is how many degrees Celsius? Zero. And boiling point of water. selection here. I'm going to give an option of the word select. Oh, I'm going to move it up. Use these arrows to move it up on the list. I'll make this auto post back. I'll pull label here. And we'll go write code on, on, on change of this. And so I'm going to copy this code over here, over there. Now this is only doing centigrade to Fahrenheit. And we're doing two things different. We're going to put the results in label two. And we're going to get the value not from the text box, but from the drop down. see what I do, did here. I copied the code, and I have in here the same formula, the right formula. So now when I run this, if I put in a value here, I can convert from Fahrenheit to centigrade. If I select the value here, It put it up there. I should say label three. So I put freezing point of water, boom, 32 Fahrenheit. Boiling point of water, 212 degrees. Okay. So, I have duplicated code, right? That formula that does centigrade to Fahrenheit is in two places. Which, again, is pretty straightforward because it's a simple formula. But what if I got it wrong? I need to fix it in two places. Extend this to something that's more complicated, that is more apt to be wrong, and extend this to stuff that's on other pages. Um, you could have a substantial amount of work to go and change that calculation. So, I have redundant code. I scream to myself, all right, because I have duplicated code. So, the answer was stated was to call a function. What is a function? It's a real basic concept, and, and, and I know you probably have had this in other classes, but it's my experience that a lot of students have issues with functions. They don't... 100% get how they work. They might be able to use them, but it gets a little confusing sometimes. So I'm going to go back to square one. What's a function? I've heard it said... Oh, go ahead. and does something, right? So what will our snippet of code do? 
it'll do a temperature conversion, right? What do we need to supply this temperature conversion for it to do its job? Number and what um, it's Fahrenheit or Celsius. Right. We need to supply two things to this function. We need to supply the, to the number that we're converting and the kind of conversion that we want to perform. All right? Functions give back answers. Answers for functions are called the return value. All right? So functions have a return value. That's the answer of the function. And in this case, the function's return value is going to be the converted temperature. All right? So inputs, process, output. We give the function everything it needs to do its job. Uh, we sometimes call functions being a black box. Black box is like a term from electrical engineering where you know what goes in and you know what comes out, but you don't really care, at least right now, about what goes on in the middle. You give the function everything it needs to do its job, the function does its job, and it outputs the results. Now you, because you're programming the function, you do need to worry about what goes on. But as far as people using the function, if you've written a good function, then the person that uses the function, another programmer that comes later on to use your function, doesn't really need to know the details of what goes on in the function. They just need to know, hey, what do I give this function, and what is the answer that I get back? So I'm going to go and I'm going to create a function. I'm going to make this function public. Protected probably would be a better choice, but um, I don't want to talk about this right now, so I'll make it public. Public simply means anyone could call this function, so we're not worried about who's calling this function. First thing you say is public, private, or protected. So I'm going to say public because I'm going to make all my functions public for now. All right? The second thing we give is we give the data type that we are going to return. Okay, the data type that we're going to return. What is the answer? What is the data type of the answer that we're going to return here? Double. A double. How many things can we return from a function? Could I return two doubles? Can you return more than one thing from a function? Answer is no. Function returns only one thing. Now, here's the kicker to that. Here's the catch. The one thing that a function returns could itself be complicated. So, for example, I could return one array, and that array could contain multiple doubles or whatever. But really, the thing that we return, there's only one of. So, I'm going to return a double. All right. I then give the name of the function, which will be convert temperature. I then give the arguments. And the arguments are the input values that you need to supply to the function. These are the ingredients that goes into the process. This is what the function needs to do its job. For example, let's say I was working in registration department. And you asked me, what is, uh, what is my tuition going to be for, for spring? person would need to give, no two, two things. They'd have to give them two pieces of information. Well, do you live in county, out of county, or out of state? How many credit hours are you taking? If you give them those two parameters, the person can do the calculation and tell you your tuition is $450 or whatever. Okay, so those are the arguments. We have to specify the type of the arguments. The temperature we're going to convert is going to also be a double. And the code is going to be a string. 
Now we could do this other ways, but this is the way we're doing it here. All right, notice there's a squiggly about there. There's a squiggly because we've promised we're going to return a double and we haven't returned a double. We've lied to this, but that's okay, we're not done. We haven't lied yet, we just haven't told the whole story. So I'm going to create a double that's called result. I'm going to copy and paste this code. Right here. function, the original code I had used things that are on the form. That's bad for this kind of function. Alright? This kind of function is sort of what you could call your business rules, because usually most applications are written for business. Or another way it could be called is your problem domain rules. Alright? The code that handles the rules of your organization or your problem domain should not touch anything about the user interface. So, drop-down list, that's the user interface, right? The uh, text box, that's the user interface. Where do we get these values instead? We get them from the arguments. So, if our type equals... FC, then result equals our temp. Our temp. So we define the function. We now just have to get the code to use it. So, I can say answer equals the name of the function, convert temperature. What's the value that we want to convert? It's wow. this. Copy and paste that there for the first argument. And what's the value of the conversion code? It's the drop down. I give it the parameters that it needs. Because I'm giving it the parameter it needs, it doesn't need to look at the user interface. From the function's perspective, it doesn't matter where the values come from. It can come from anywhere. It's just going to do its job with the parameters. These values get plugged into these arguments in the order that they appear in the function. So this first one gets put here. The second argument gets put here into that variable. We then do the job. We return the result, and what happens to the result? It gets put in the variable answer, and then we can display that. Display. All right. What's the difference between these two things? Well, I don't want to do that. The value 
I'm getting now comes from not the text box, but Okay, I'm confused. Comes from a selected value of this. And what's the conversion type? Well, I'm always doing con converting centigrade to Fahrenheit. So I can just hard code that. I think this will work. Let's test it out. So I put in a value here, Fahrenheit to centigrade, convert. I assume that's correct. Let's try 32. Yep. Centigrade to Fahrenheit, boiling point of water. 212. So it works. Now, if I got something wrong with the conversion calculation, if I made this by typo and I said 132 instead of 32, I go and run this, I get bad results. 212, no, I want to do centigrade, centigrade to Fahrenheit. 100 centigrade to Fahrenheit, it's 212. No, I want to do Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. Yeah, that's not right. Let me actually mess up this one instead. Let's change this to be plus 132. If I get this function wrong, 100 centigrade to Fahrenheit, 312. What's the boiling point of water? 312. Notice at least gave me consistent results, all right? which I guess isn't great because they're wrong, right? But the good news is, is to correct it, you only have to make the change in one place. All right? And that'll correct both of them. Now let's look closer at this. All right? We kind of have two different kinds of functions here. All right? We have functions that deal with the user interface, and we have functions that actually do our business or our, our problem calculations. Notice that we don't mix those. This function doesn't have any code that deals with the user interface. We don't look at text boxes. We don't look at... Um, drop downs or anything like that. Anything this function needs to do its job gets passed as an argument. This function, in addition, doesn't do any of the business calculations. In other words, nowhere in here is there the calculation from centigrade to Fahrenheit. All we do is we, we delegate that to someone else. We ask the business rule, hey, what is your, uh, what is the calculation, what is the conversion for these values? The more that you can separate those two things, user interface code with business logic, the better off that you can be. Because that allows you to use your business logic um, in multiple places. You have reusable code. Sort of the opposite of redundant code is reusable code. If everything is, if all the code is in one place, then you don't have to make redundant code. You can just access wherever that code happens to live. So our event, our user event, when the user clicks the button, something happens, is actually, does have a lot of code in it. 
because it delegates the actual calculation to a business object. All right. Now, we are better than we were when we started today because we don't have to have duplicated code for us to do the calculation from two different places on the same page. Guess what? What if I added a second page that also needed to do, to do this Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation? I'd be back in the same boat. I'd have to duplicate that calculation. And that's not good. All right? How do you think we're going to solve that? How are we going to solve it so that not just one page can call this function, but a bunch of pages can call this function? Yes? Would it be kind of like uh, having a CSS, like you can have all the calculations in one place and then just put them up there? Exactly. We're going to put it in its own file. We're going to put it in its own place so that every page can, can, can use it. And you're absolutely right. It's exactly like CSS, where you separate them, you put it in one place, and then everyone can use it. What is the place that we're going to put this code called in C Sharp? What is the place that we're going to put code that we want to share between different pages? A class, thank you. I was going to try to play password if that didn't work. Where did you come to this morning? I came to class. You're right, class. All right. It's called a class or a custom class sometimes. Uh, a class, again, is a building block, something you can use to build your application. As we've stated before, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. You don't want to have to repeat the calculation in every place that you want to do the calculation. You want that calculation to be in one place. Um, there are a lot of classes that are built in the .NET framework. The text boxes and drop downs and all those things. All these classes they build to sort of give you a head start in building your application. So you don't have to do everything from scratch. Well, they can create classes for the things that are going to be on a lot of different web applications, but things that are specific to your web application like maybe your shipping calculation, or the conversion from centigrade to Fahrenheit, or whatever other kind of calculation you need, you could create your own custom class so that you can reuse it. That's what we'll do on Tuesday. Okay, cool. Is we'll take the code that we put here and make it accessible from any page within this application. All right? And then we will have gotten rid of all the redundancies and our code will be better. Now, Again, when you're evaluating how good a program, it, program is, there is some subjectivity to it. You know, we could say, I think this has a more straightforward design or whatever. Or I prefer to use case statements instead of if statements or something like that. But when it comes to reusability, objectively, the code where there's, the code only lives in one place in a custom class is better than if the code is duplicated in several different places. I mean, that's not, that's not subject to debate, all right? It's better code to do that. Um, all right, I'm going to um, stop the recording. I'm going to come back and get my files, and, um, but first I'm going to let you in the lab.